37 minutes past the hour right now. It could be uh, really the biggest earthquake yet waiting to strike. Could it be? I wonder. Uh, in the last 12 months, Chile, New Zealand, now Japan have all suffered massive earthquakes. That means three of the four corners of the Pacific Ring of Fire have been hit, leaving just one corner, California, untouched for now. And that was the subject of a cover story, Newsweek's cover story, out right now. It explores the possibility that the scariest quake at least for the United States, may be yet to come. And it was written by our next guest, journalist and geologist Simon Winchester. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. I know it's certainly hard to predict um, exactly when and where you find out more information after the fact than beforehand. But if you're looking at history as a guide, we're due, or that, that, that particular fault line is due. You would think so. I mean, you've got the San Andreas Fault, which last ruptured in 1906, and there are enormous strains under San Francisco as we speak. And then the even more dangerous, rather more ominous, undersea fault known as the Cascadia Fault, mm -hmm. which is about 50 miles off the coast, which hasn't ruptured for 250 years. So statistically, they are ready to pop, as it were. I don't mean to be lighthearted about this, but right. from a geological point of view, they're poised in a very dangerous position. And earthquakes tend to happen. There is some argument about this, but they seem to happen in clusters. I mean, you, for instance, in 1906, there was an earthquake a few weeks before the San Francisco devastation in Chile, or Ecuador, killed 20,000 people. Another one in what was then Formosa, now Taiwan, all in this same general area. Now we've had February the 22nd, Christchurch, New Zealand. Last year, Chile, big bad earthquake. Yes. Last week, Japan. It looks beguiling from a statistical point of view that either the Cascadia or the San Andreas is at least more ready to rupture than, let's say, 50 years ago. You mentioned 1906. I mean, was there, I mean, I, I guess we can't, or can we know that it was more than just coincidence that there were these, um, that the, the other seismic activity before 1906, or is it sort of a scientific foreshadowing? It's, that is the big argument. We're, among geologists, they don't know. But I mean, you're seeing at, right now the activity before the 1906 San Francisco quake. Uh, you can see, again, that ring of fire around mm -hmm. the world where you, ha you had um, those precursors to what was a, a terrible earthquake in San Francisco. Well, it, right. And, and um, you remember a few years ago, you had the, the earthquake in western China a year before that earthquake in Kashmir. They, they tend to come in, in discrete right. tectonic areas of the world in in clusters, and this seems to be what's happening here. So, Simon, if uh, an earthquake were to hit, especially as you talk about, is it proper to say the subduction zone, like underneath uh, in the ocean for the well, Cascadian? There, to, the Cascadia is the important right. one. It's the one that's very little known about. How, how much damage could it do well, to that, San Francisco or a, a, the a, coast? A, a, the coast a great deal. I mean, if the San Andreas was to pop, it's under the land. That would cause devastation on the land. It would, you know bridges would come down, buildings would come down in a long swath all the way from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Even after all this retrofitting work, even after all of the, the well, changes they made since 1989? Two years since the Loma Prieta uh -huh. earthquake. Uh -huh. Still, the Bay Bridge isn't fully retrofitted. Right. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous that it's... the politicians haven't got their act together to do this. But leaving aside the damage that would inevitably be caused by a rupture of the San Andreas, the Cascadia, which no one in this country. There's no historic, uh, last time was 250 years ago when this country was more or less unpopulated. Right. Um, that would cause, without a doubt, tsunamis. They would mostly uh, be on the western coast of Vancouver Island, so towns like Lucluelet and, and Tofino and Bamfield. But then moving down the coast, Seattle, the Straits of Juan de Fuca, the nuclear base, at, or the atomic submarine base at Bellingham, Washington, uh, Portland, and then, of course, uh, Northern California and San Francisco. So people need to be aware. Not, I, I don't want to be a purveyor of doom. I'm simply saying that people need to know that this thing is in the offing and that uh, it's not merely, as if merely is the word to use, destruction of buildings in San Francisco. That's one fault, but the Cascadia would cause, without a doubt, a huge, I mean, a very, very big tsunami. The last time, it caused the tsunami win which went all the way to Japan. We've been waiting for that big one for a very long time, though. I mean, we waiting for the big one to hit California. People who live in California either joke about it or fear about it. Fear exactly. it, depending on, on, on where you stand. When you look at Japan, Japan has, um, you know, uh, it's the same size, a little bit less than the size of California with four times as many people. So when you think about the number of people packed in Japan and how that destruction has been so widespread, what would it look like in California if we had if we had the next big one. Well, it depends whether it's an earthquake or a tsunami. I mean, one of the things, good Lord, there's nothing nice can be said about it, is that when there's a tsunami, 
all you can do is run away from it or drive away from it and drive upwards if you can into hills because obviously a tsunami is a certain height and the one that is usually the figure that is bandied around for a Cascadia uh, uh, tsunami would be about 100 feet. So considerably, 100 feet. Oh, yes. And as we're, big talking, as the one, we're talking in, in, uh, in Japan, in Sendai, you were talking 30 13. Feet. 13 or 30? Well, there was one 10 meters so in Sendai that was 30 mm -hmm. feet. Okay. Krakatoa, which I read a book about some years ago, that was 130 feet. I mean, that was a monster wave, which went all round the Indian Ocean, came all round the Atlantic, was actually detected in the English Channel, I mean, 13,000 sea miles away. So these waves propagate enormous distances. Cascadia is very close to the North American coast. The resulting tsunami, depending on the size of the earthquake, of course, could be as big as 100 feet. And if that were to happen, well, you attempt to run up a hill which is 101 feet high, and then you'll survive. Uh, and the problem in Japan was that in that part of Japan, it was a flat coastal plain. Mm -hmm. There was nowhere to run to. Was, right. You could run away, but you couldn't run up. And so people died in large numbers, and towns were devastated. It wouldn't, therefore, be quite as bad, because the topography of Washington, Oregon, California, and Vancouver Island is that there are lots of hills. So sure. people given a warning, and an adequate warning, they wouldn't get a terribly long warning, but... You know, the sophisticated sensors are, ever since the event in, in Sumatra five years ago, they're getting more and more sophisticated. We get some minutes warning. People would, should be advised to go uphill, right. and then people would survive. But nonetheless, there would be a lot of devastation. So part of it is not to live your life in fear, obviously. You can't no, no, control no. the events of other nature, but you can be aware and, and maybe have in the back of your mind of what you would do in those cases. And then on the flip side, as you said, uh, in terms of getting San Francisco or other areas along that fault line, ready. I mean, in Japan, they withstand very large earthquakes, and their buildings withstand very large earthquakes uh, constant, nearly constantly. Yes. I mean, and the, my wife is Japanese, so I have some knowledge about the order and discipline and duty and realizing that the state often, often, not always knows best and organize, puts plans into operation. I mean, here, I don't want to get into politics, obviously, but budgets are being cut, warning systems, geological departments. You know, the whole, it's a sort of invisible thing because warning systems are to right. do with something that may or may not happen. Right. You should not cut budgets for this kind of thing, and that seems to be what's happening these days. Well, hopefully people will listen. You have a very, very interesting article in Newsweek, and again, as you said, you did write the Krakatoa interesting book as well. Simon Winchester, thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you very much indeed.